the same mystery that we have ever since Plato just comes back to us. How is it that the world is so rational? Maybe there has been a wrong assumption that science is the process of trying to find absolute answers as opposed to having this North, North Star goal which just keeps motiv motivating us to find out more. It's slight... Yes, mm -hmm. so I think it, we were discussing about that <laughs> a little bit before. Yeah. I think it depends as well a little bit on what type of science you, you're doing. And, uh, at least we, we are very much into fundamental science and so we understand that it's not about having an ultimate truth. We, the way we understand the world is a, is a very good description of what happens but at some point something else has to take over. It doesn't mean that our excellent description we just throw it away and, and we just replace it. It is, it is excellent for our everyday life and you, we, you all came here without needing to know about the ultimate truth about everything uh, because that was good enough for us to live the life that, that we're doing and it's going to be for most of the time um, as well. But there are even now, there, there are in our understanding of physics beyond the, the realm, different dual descriptions and so you can see things in a particular color or you can see a symmetric version of that uh, that use different tools that use different words and yet it gives the same predictions it gives the same uh, type of underlying phenomena and yet there are different ways to to see it and so what is what is it we're doing? Are we really trying to look for an ultimate truth? No, we are trying to make connection with nature and trying to see how we can embrace it and, and understand in the best we can in a way that we can make predictions and then go further in that quest. Avshalom, do you want to chime in? Actually, can we, um, can we even imagine a final theory? Suppose, just let's imagine it and we will see that it's impossible. Suppose somebody comes and says, you want to know why the, the constants of the universe are this and not others? Here is the answer. You can't even think about it because then every child will ask, so why this number and not another? So the sense of mystery will always remain. Think about the, uh, the Big Bang. We thought that it explains everything. Immediately, once there was the theory of the Big Bang, people asked what has been before that. And then, and then a cosmologist said, you can't ask what happened before the Big Bang because time itself was created uh, at, at that time. Does that spell, uh, dispel the mystery? I think that it makes it even more mysterious. There is a beautiful book by, by Dawkins, Unweaving the Rainbow. So uh, yeah, uh, Dawkins, who is a very um, um, militant atheist, said, look, actually there is nothing mysterious in our universe. Okay, uh, science just show, shows you how the rainbow is beautiful, but uh, it dispels all the mystery. No, it does not. I, I'm thinking about the way Dawkins tried to explain why our universe obeys such beautiful mathematical laws. And he said, here is an explanation. You know Darwin's theory? Darwin's theory explains life. So you ask about the universe, here it is. Universes give birth to one another, universes die, so you have an evolution of universes. We live in a universe which is rich enough to host life and, intelligent, and intelligence. Immediately the question comes, if there, is such a universe, if there is such a natural selection of universes, there must be a multi, uh, some kind of a hyper-universe in which this lawfulness exists. And then the same mystery that we have ever since Plato just comes back to us. How is it that the world is so rational? The most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. Say that again. The most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. That's a miracle. And, okay, I, I know that I sound like a school teacher, but uh, there is a... Uh, there is a a paper that you all want to read, and this is by John Wigner on the unnatural, on the uh, miraculous fitness of mathematics to the language of science. And he ends it with, he was also, a, I believe, an atheist, with a beautiful uh, kind of religious ending. The, uh, the application, the fitness of mathematics to our universe is a miracle that we don't understand, neither deserve. So at least let's learn to appreciate this, this gift. 
it's always amazing with these debates how quickly they can just expand um, and to try and contain it a little could we assume that the models that we have are there specifically to address certain aims and purposes of our understanding Harry I'm going to go to you first I mean I think our theories or our models that we use to describe the universe, they're just an approximate description that matches the current data that we have. I think there's, there's just an interesting debate to be had about at what point do we have so much evidence for some phenomena or some concept that we start to think of it as actually being real. So actually I was recently criticised in a review of my book, which we'll, I'll be selling in the bookshop afterwards, um, where I kept talking about, I'm a particle physicist, and I kept talking about the, the basic building blocks of the universe being quantum fields. These are these, mathematically, these kind of infinite uh, things in space and time that particles are little vibrations in. And we think of them in our theory of, as being the elementary constituents of the universe. And there's so much evidence for quantum fields, as, and it's such a great description of all the precise data that we get from a whole range of experiments, that we tend to just talk about them as if they physically exist. And I suppose in the back of everyone's of scientist's mind, you're thinking, OK, well, you're aware, yes, this is a model. It's an approximate description. But if you say that all the time, it makes having a conversation very difficult. It's a bit like, you know, this chair, for example. If my internal model of a chair is it has some legs that support it, it's got a flat surface to sit on, I can do an experiment where I sit on it. All I'm actually experiencing are the electrical signals from the nerves in my bum and you know, the photons that hit my eyes and my retinas. But at some point I say, okay, the data matches this concept well enough that I believe the chair is real. So we don't go around, if you went around thinking, oh, is this chair actually real or is it just some conceptual idea, you'd never sit down. And I think it's a bit like that in science, that we, at some point we accept these ideas as being as being real and we kind of imagine them to be real even though we sort of know okay yes it's possible that maybe there's another way of looking at the same phenomena which I think is what Claudia was talking about with this idea of dual theories where you can have two different ways of describing yes, the same yes, data. Yes so we're starting to go then I think th that is very interesting in the way fundamental science is going nowadays that um, we have for some models very dual, symmetric, and symmetry is part of all of, all of it, which, which I think is resonating with your question of why we, I have the ability of seeing the world in such a symmetric way. But in the way we represent the world, we can have a particular picture or, or something which uh, we wouldn't recognize it as being the same at all, and yet it gives us exactly the same predictions, uh, exactly the same way to understand the world. Uh, and that, who is to say which is which? Is which? Neither, neither is right, neither is wrong. Uh, and we accept that. We're actually quite comfortable with this idea that we're reaching a realm where our ability to even understand how to connect with reality starts making sense. And, and what we can do is have approximations uh, of everything. So I think there is a sense in which um, there is a notion of reality we, we will all agree on, um, and that can go to the existence of fundamental particle if we want to. But we are reaching a new area in, in how we connect with nature in that it is not about having a, a fundamental truth, let's say. It's about having the ability to connect with it and having prediction for what, what will come out of this, of this description. And if everything that you predict uh, turns out to, to be realized, turns out to be the way you thought it should be, then who is to say whether that's reality or not? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not going to say that's reality, but that's cl as close to reality that we can env envision. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.